This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Turducken. It's a well-known fact that we here at the Word of the Week office are big fans of Thanksgiving. As we said earlier this month, we really enjoy the opportunity to gather with friends and family and share their successes and triumphs of the preceding year. We like reconnecting with those who have been separated by the vagaries of life and checking in with folks we haven't seen since this same time last year. And to top it all off, we get to sit around a table and partake of a meal filled with all the sorts of foods you just naturally reserve for these kinds of special occasions. Sweet potatoes and marshmallows are a rare and special dish that is best reserved for but one special day. Green bean casserole with those crispy bits of apparently onion sprinkled haphazardly over the top of a questionably prepared can of cream of mushroom soup? How could you dare serve that at any other time of the year? Where else can you get literally a year's worth of Brussels sprouts and zucchini all in one go? Indeed, even a box of stuffing lovingly prepared by cramming it into the interior of a bird that already takes hours of careful cooking and minding is best served at a time when people are guaranteed to have at least a couple of days off in a row for recovery. Many Thanksgiving dinners have been made memorable by these dishes alone. And yet, and yet we find ourselves contemplating the star of the show, the centerpiece of the whole occasion that with which the typical family will be saddled for at least the rest of the week, what with sandwiches and soups and an ever-dwindling supply of nibbly bits. That's right, the very bird mentioned above, the turkey. And while we like the turkey just fine, in its dark meat and its light meat, its drumsticks and its wings and its crispy skin and flavorful gravy, we, well... We sometimes wonder if it couldn't somehow be improved ever so slightly. And while we know there are any number of methods of preparation, from roasting to frying to barbecuing, that can be performed on the bird in question, we cannot help but turn our eye towards the holy grail of Thanksgiving main courses. Long has it loomed on the horizon of culinary combinations that are bandied about on the lips of those who would be considered the grand gourmands of their respective family units, the turducken. And so, at long last we turn to this famous formulation of farmyard fowl and finally feature our feast of philological findings. What exactly is a turducken? Where did it come from? And why would you even want one? Well, for those of you not in the know, The word turducken is a portmanteau. A portmanteau is a word created by mashing two or more other words together and then throwing out all the bits that don't fit. For example, motorcycle is a portmanteau of the words motorized and bicycle. The word portmanteau itself was first explained and used to describe such words rather neatly in Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. In it, Humpty Dumpty is explaining to Alice that several of the words used in the poem Jabberwocky are, in fact, portmanteaus. You see, he says, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up into one word. Which makes a bit more sense when you realize that at the time a portmanteau was basically a two-part suitcase. Thus, slithy is made up of the words slimy and lithe, while chortle combined chuckle and snort. In the case of turducken, you have three words all stuffed into one, which seems fitting when you consider what the thing actually is. Turducken is a portmanteau of turkey, duck, and chicken, and is an apt description of the dish itself. You literally stuff a chicken inside a duck, and then stuff that inside a turkey. Naturally, you have to take some stuff out first to make room... But fortunately, nearly every whole fowl is born with all their important bits already inside a little baggie. Isn't nature amazing? There is a long tradition of stuffing things inside other things as a method of preparation and cooking. Leaving aside such things as stuffed peppers, pork chops, noodles, pastries, and so on, less familiar forms are often seen as a way to make the most of limited supplies of food or to preserve food from times of plenty to be made use of in leaner times. 
Kvyak is often given as one example of such storing until needed. In parts of Greenland, the local people will catch thousands of the little auk species of bird, a bird that looks sort of like a penguin but is able to fly properly. They'll do this in the late summer and early autumn, before they fly south for the winter. Then, having caught, killed, and skinned a seal, they will sew up to 500 of the birds into the seal skin, where they will begin to ferment. Sealed against the air with seal fat and buried in a pile of rocks to help keep the air out, they will be left until the winter hits. Properly fermented, the little ox are consumed throughout the winter and are described as a local delicacy. Although, if you ask us, when it comes to things that are eaten as a matter of survival, using the term delicacy may be stretching it a bit. Take, for example, the Siege of Leningrad. In June of 1941, German forces began Operation Barbarossa with the intention of capturing the Western Soviet Union and repopulating it with Germans. As part of the plan, the city of Leningrad, population roughly 3.5 million, was to be taken and destroyed as the Nazi forces aided, in part, by Finland, who wanted to retake part of their country lost to the Soviet Union in the Winter War just two years before, rolled across Russia to capture oil reserves and agricultural resources. Initially, Hitler and the Nazis thought the capture of Leningrad was such a sure thing that a party was scheduled in Leningrad on the supposed day of capture before the offensive was even launched. Needless to say, the Germans did not find it so easy, and throughout June, July, and August of 1941, fierce fighting and bombardments ensued in and around Leningrad. Women and children and others were evacuated from the city as quickly as they could be, and resistance was strong. Even so, German troops encircled Leningrad on the 8th of September and began what was to become known as the Siege of Leningrad, a siege that would last for nearly 900 days. Times were, of course, desperate. At the outset of the siege, it was estimated that Leningrad had only enough food to last, at best, 35 to 40 days. With an influx of refugees from outlying areas prior to the siege, supplies were already strained to their maximum, and the Germans made a particular point of bombarding, bombing, and destroying the food production and storage facilities throughout the city. Even before the siege officially began, residents were on tight rations. Manual laborers were limited to 600 grams, or a little over 21 ounces, of bread a day. Children and civilians had half that. Over the length of the siege, these numbers were reduced a further four times, until manual laborers were only getting 250 grams, or about 9 ounces of bread a day, by the end of November. As the siege went on, people were so desperate for food that they were tearing wallpaper from the walls to get at the potato starch-based glue so they could boil it up into a thin soup. All the zoo animals had been eaten, no one had any pets anymore, and officials found it necessary to ban ground meat in a city where no animals existed to provide it, and corpses had begun turning up with missing limbs. So you can imagine how enthused people were when they discovered 2,000 tons of sheep guts at the seaport. The cold winter had preserved it enough to still be usable, and the city officials had it turned into galantines for the public to consume. A galantine is a French dish made of stuffed meat, usually poached, and then served cold after being coated in aspic. Meat, usually fish or poultry, is forced through a fine mesh or ground up with fat, to produce a meat paste of varying consistency, which is then stuffed into other meat and made into a round log shape. It's not entirely dissimilar to what you might know as pimento loaf, except being French, it is, of course, much fancier and a delicacy. But when you're starving, you don't care about all that. You just want food and lots of it. So 2,000 pounds of anything even vaguely edible doesn't last long, which is why when the bits of sheep ran out, they switched to calfskin to stuff the galantine with. Calfskin which, by many accounts, was much the worse for wear and hadn't been preserved nearly so well. It stunk, and people who survived the siege said they could remember the stench of it even years afterwards. Fortunately, 
Some of the starvation was eased as residents were able to get small gardens going in the following year. Eventually, the Soviets were able to make small temporary breaches in the encircling German forces and bring in small amounts of relief supplies while evacuating about 1.4 million civilians, though many of them perished along the way. Finally, in January of 1944, the siege was broken. Record keeping was pretty poor at the time, but the death toll from starvation and disease was estimated to be between 1.1 and 1.5 million. In the end, only 700,000 people remained alive in Leningrad. Of those, 300,000 were soldiers from outlying areas that had come to help. The turducken is a form of cuisine known as ingastration, which means to stuff one animal into the gastric passage of another. In the turducken, a chicken is deboned and stuffed inside a deboned duck, which is then stuffed into a deboned turkey. The in-between layers and any gaps, such as the interior of the chicken, may be filled in with a bread stuffing if desired. Another popular option is to fill the gaps with sausage meat of one sort or another, depending on preference. The idea being to create a solid mass of meat that then cooks evenly and all at approximately the same time, although this process can be helped somewhat by a bit of judicious pre-cooking of the various birds in question so as to ensure doneness in the final product. While a turducken may be the most well-known form of engastration in the modern day, it is not the only such recipe. It's not even the most extravagant. And since engastration is a process in use from the Middle Ages, and you know what sort of things they ate, you can only imagine how crazy it used to get. By way of example, the cockentrice, not to be confused with a cockatrice, the cockentrice was a dish consisting of the front half of a suckling pig, Frankensteined onto the bottom half of a turkey, and stuffed in various ways. Supposedly, the Tudors of medieval England enjoyed the dish. Oh, and it was also permissible to do it the other way around as well. That way everyone at the long table could be equally horrified. We're sure it was a lot of fun for the king to see the looks on everyone's faces when the dish was plopped down in front of them. But even that isn't the pinnacle of surprising foodstuffs. One contender comes from Alexander Balthazar Laurent Grimond de la Reniere's 1807 cookbook Le Almanac de Gourmand, the Gourmet Almanac. In it, he proposes a recipe for the roast without equal, which consists, according to one source, of the following. A bustard stuffed with a turkey, stuffed with a goose, stuffed with a pheasant, stuffed with a chicken, stuffed with a duck, stuffed with a guinea fowl, stuffed with a teal, stuffed with a woodcock, stuffed with a partridge, stuffed with a plover, stuffed with a lapwing, stuffed with a quail, stuffed with a thrush, stuffed with a lark, stuffed with an ortolan bunting, stuffed with a garden warbler, stuffed with an olive, stuffed with an anchovy, stuffed with a single caper, with layers of Luca chestnuts, forcemeat, and bread stuffing between each bird, stewed in a hermetically sealed pot in a bath of onion, clove, carrots, chopped ham, celery, thyme, parsley, mijonet, salted pork fat, salt, pepper, coriander, garlic, and other spices, and slowly cooked over a fire for at least 24 hours. If you don't know what some of those birds are, don't worry about it. Most of them are in some way endangered or illegal to obtain anymore presumably because of dishes exactly like this. By comparison, the possibly fictional, possibly real dish referred to as a Bedouin wedding feast is nothing. According to its entry in the Guinness Book of World Records for largest item on a menu, it's merely an elaborate dish which includes cooked eggs which are stuffed into fish. The fish are then stuffed into cooked chickens, and the chickens are stuffed into a roasted sheep's carcass. Lastly, the sheep is stuffed into a whole camel. Tasty! Lest you think all these sorts of things are well left in the past and need never be a thing again, let us introduce you to Michael Mina. Born in Egypt and raised in Washington State, Mina owns numerous restaurants around the country. He's written several cookbooks and has cooked for three presidents. In August of 2014, he opened a restaurant inside the San Francisco 49ers Levi Stadium. He was happy to brag about the restaurant's giant rotisseries, 
big enough to hold an entire side of beef, he said. That Thanksgiving, one of his head chefs, David Varley, took him up on his claim and created what we and several other people are going to call roast beast. It is a side of Wagyu beef, a Japanese type of beef, rolled over a deboned parade of meat. 24 quail, 12 chickens, 8 ducks, 6 turkeys, 2 lambs, and a pig, all stuffed with chestnut turkey sausage. And at $5,000 a plate, that's more than enough for us. We don't need to know any more. Frankly, the only reason we know about turducken is because of football. American football, not that thing they play in Europe. Though, increasingly, they play American football in Europe, too, now. So, we're going to have to come up with some other way to tell the two different types apart. I know, let's call the European thing soccer, since that's a shortening of association football, which is what soccer, football... European football, which is really mostly British football because it was all based on the British Football Association rules, actually is. It'll save confusion. Let's start again. The only reason we know about Turducken is because of American football, specifically because of one American football game and one American football game commentator, John Madden. The story goes a little like this. In August of 1997, Madden, a former NFL coach turned broadcast commentary man for television, was in New Orleans for the Saints vs. St. Louis Rams game. A local radio personality wanted to get Madden to try a turducken from local butcher Glenn Mistich, who up to this point sold about 250 of them a year. Arrangements were made, and a Saints public relations man brought a turducken into the booth where John Madden and colleague Kurt Gowdy were calling the game. It smelled and looked so good to Madden that he didn't wait for plates or silverware to show up before digging in with his bare hands and trying some. Evidence says he loved it, and so he talked about it on air. The next week, Madden called Mistich up and asked him to send one out to Los Angeles for the game there. Soon after that, Madden declared the turducken the official food of his all-Madden team, a running list of players Madden thought were the best in the game at any given time. Madden kept talking about the turducken throughout the remainder of his broadcasting career, and as of 2017, still receives two of the now more than 5,000 turducken mistich cells every year. Madden brought the dish to national consciousness. And you'd have thought the man who claimed to have created the turducken would have been able to do that. Paul Prudhomme was a celebrity chef who specialized in Cajun and Creole cuisine. In fact, he's credited with popularizing those cuisines throughout America, along with a dish called blackened redfish in the 1980s. So popular did he make that dish that the redfish had to be protected to prevent its extinction. In all, he wrote 11 cookbooks, opened numerous restaurants, and in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, he cooked for free for those involved in the restoration efforts in the French Quarter of New Orleans, making over 6,000 meals in 10 days with his team. In 1986, Prudhomme copyrighted the name Turducken. According to him, he created the dish in the 1970s while working at a restaurant in Wyoming. But as we've seen, it might just be that he created a variation on an older dish, one that involved fewer larks, quail, and camels. The problem is, Junior and Sammy Hebert of Hebert's Specialty Meats in Louisiana also claimed to have created the dish in 1985 at the request of a local man who just happened to have all three birds that needed dressing at the same time. New Orleans surgeon Dr. Gerald R. Lanasa is also given credit for the turducken thanks to his habit of deboning the birds with his surgical scalpels, assembling them, and then adding additional stuffings of veal or pork inside the chicken. His much earlier efforts, beginning in the 1900s and running up through the 60s, might give him more claim, and it is certainly fair to say that his method is the kind of turducken most available commercially. And variations on the theme are endless. Substitute one bird for any other in the combination and you could say you created something new. One of the most popular variations is the goo-ducken, a goose-duck-chicken combo. But there also exists something called Pandora's Cushion, a combination of goose stuffed with chicken stuffed with quail. 
The fact of the matter is that there are just so many variations and possibilities going back so far into gustatory history that it's not unlikely that someone else got there first with these three relatively common farmyard birds. A certain inevitability of invention begins to occur. Did Prudhomme create it out of whole cloth? Probably not. Did he come up with a variation of the theme that caught a minor foothold in the southern states of America? That seems more likely. Did others also come up with the idea? Yes, indeed. And by and large, that's the story of the turducken, a somewhat fanciful dish that can, if you have the wherewithal and the desire to do so, replace the standard turkey at your holiday table. It seems nice enough that we've never had one ourselves. Possibly you have and you'll tell us about it. But before we go, we want to tell you about one other modern delight on the theme of foods stuffed inside other foods. And boy, is this one special. So take careful notes as we spell it out for you. All hail a man named Charles Phoenix. He's a humorist, author, historian, and chef who specializes in Americana of the 50s and 60s. One day, not too long ago, he made a Thanksgiving Day observation. See, his family liked desserts, lots of different desserts. There was cake, three kinds, and there were pies, three kinds. And as he watched his family partake, and he himself partook, he noticed that everyone, himself included, was taking small slices of everything. A bit of each of the three pies, a bit of each of the three cakes, and he thought, this could be better. And so was born the Cherpumple. Inspired by the Turducken and by his family's holiday habits, he decided to combine all the desserts into one. The Cherpumple is made of cherry, pumpkin, and apple pies surrounded by moist, delicious cakes stacked one atop the other. His instructions are pretty clear. Bake the 8-inch pies as required. Set them aside to cool. For the cherry pie, prepare white cake mix. For the pumpkin, yellow cake. And for the apple, spice cake. Get three cake pans and carefully remove the pies from the tins. Place one pie in the center of each cake pan and pour the appropriate cake batter over and around them. Bake them according to cake instructions. Allow them to cool and then stack them one atop the other and frost with cream cheese frosting. When frosting is complete, carefully wrap and protect the entire chipumple. Seal it in a box. And then send the whole thing to us. Happy Thanksgiving. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Mm-hmm.